Okay. So, uh, so now I, it's really my pleasure to introduce Len Zolotov. I just met him in the past couple of days. Uh, he's a, he's a, an author. Uh, he does a columnist at Make Magazine, but he's also uh, uh, a professional screenwriter and uh, has done a number of things uh, that you're probably more familiar with than I am, but he's, uh, he's, the, uh, he's the originator of the MacGyver television series. So, Len, welcome. <laughs> So, this did a lot of blinking and flashing. I only do this much blinking and flashing, so that's the extent of my blinking and flashing. My name is Lee Slotoff, and as Stu said, I created the MacGyver series, which some of you have probably seen. How many of you have seen it? That's, that's good, that's good. Okay, so. I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I assume you can hear me because I can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I really want to sort of talk about, about the power of ideas. And I'll, I'm going to tell you kind of how the whole MacGyver series got started. And I'll tell you what's going on in the world of MacGyver today because lots of exciting things are still happening, believe it or not. Um, but it really started in a funny way, because all things kind of go in funny ways, particularly when you're making things was um, I went to this very interesting college, which is in some ways kind of a very radical but extremely conservative college called St. John's College. How many of you have ever heard of St. John's College? Oh, that's pretty good. Okay, I'm impressed. Not, not the one with the basketball team. That's St. John's University. That's in Queens. St. John's College is a small liberal arts school. They have a campus in Annapolis, Maryland. They have a campus in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And what you do is you read and discuss the great books of the Western world for four years. That's all you do. Everybody takes the same four-year set program. There are really no electives, there are no departments, there are no majors, there are tutors and there are students, and, and all the classes are small and they're all seminar classes. And the reason they do this is because unlike most higher education in this country, which is really kind of geared towards getting you into a specific job or a profession, which is, in a sense, just a continuation of elementary education, which is they stuff you full of material, and you kind of regurgitate it back to them, and they go, okay, you've remembered enough of this stuff, they give you grade, and then you can probably forget that material and go stuff yourself with somebody else's information. This is not about information. This is not about right answers. This is about asking the right questions. This is about learning to think for yourself. This is about learning to speak, learning to listen, and learning to write. So there I was in this college, okay, which is all about ideas and learning to think. And I will tell you that it is an extraordinary education because it sort of blew the top off of my head. Because you're forced to sort of realize, why do I think the things I think? You're sitting in a seminar and you think, somebody says, well, I think this is virtue, and somebody else says, yeah, well, what makes you think that? And then you have to defend why you think it, and you discover after a little while that, you know, that you suddenly realize, why do I think the things that I do? Where did I get all this stuff from, you know? And so, while I was at St. John's, and I'm reading all these great books, and you start with the Iliad, and you go all the way up to Einstein, and Freud, and, you know, and you don't, there's no textbooks. So it's not about taking tests. It's all about, as I say, reading and discussion. And I kind of said to myself at some point, where are the great books of tomorrow? And I realized that in a certain way, the great books of tomorrow, that is the things that shape our society, are really coming from film and television. Film and television are really doing more to shape the opinions of the world than in many ways books are. Not that books aren't important and people still don't write really important and valuable books, but so I said, I'm really curious about getting into film and television. And so that's the that's the path that I pursued. Um, P.S., I'll jump a few years, because it takes a while to get into that business. You don't just walk in and say, I'm here, and they go, great, here's a job. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You kind of have to pound your head against the wall for a while, which I did both briefly in New York. I wrote for a soap opera for a really exciting year or so. Um, and, uh, and then I moved out to Los Angeles, surprise, surprise, where they do a lot of this stuff. And, um, and I was working on a number of shows. Some of you may have heard of these shows. I worked on a show called um, uh, Hill Street Blues, and I worked on a show called uh, uh, Remington Steel for a while. Um, and then I kind of took a break, and, 
And, uh, and, and I wasn't working for a while because I was kind of burned out. You write episodic television, you really got to kind of, you know, you're working all the time. And so my agent called me and said, listen, these people at Paramount, they have sold the show to ABC. You don't have to sell the show. You just have to go in and write the script. And I thought, great, that's great. It's already sold. I don't have to go through what they call the pitching process, you know. I thought, perfect. So I went over and I, I, I we made the deal and I went over and I sat down and they said, okay, here's the show. It's called Hourglass. I said, okay, that sounds like a cool title. And they said, and we want to do one hour of real time, it's one hour of television. I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? And they said, well, you know, we're going to have a ticking clock and, and, um, and the whole show is going to take place in one hour. Kind of like, I guess, eventually what 24 did. Only they didn't want this to be like 24 consecutive hours. They wanted every hour to kind of be what, what they call a standalone episode. Okay? And I said, listen, I, I, I hate to say this. You know, like in engineering sometimes, in entertainment business, things sound great in the room, but that's because the people in the room aren't necessarily the ones who have to go out and make them. You know, we're going to make a car that goes a thousand miles on a tank of gas. And then you turn to the engineers and you say, that you can do that, right? They go, uh, not in this lifetime, I don't think we can, you know? So, but, but, you know, it sounded good in the room. So, so I said, fellas, I think you got a problem. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, I can only think of a few ideas that this is going to work because you got to basically start the show where you're going to end it because if you're really going to stick to that ticking clock one out, what happens if this guy has to go, like, across town? I mean, we're going to wait for a half hour while we watch him travel across. Well, they said, he knows the bus schedule, so you can jump on the back of buses. And I said, it's not going to work. I mean, the one thing you have in film and television, which you may or may not be aware of, is you can cut space and time, you know, like that. That's how you tell a story, right? And they said, and you're taking that away, guys, okay? You got four or five shows. You got the Bank Vault show. You got the Mine Shaft show. You got the Sinking Submarine show. I said, you know, after four or five episodes, you, you're not going to be able to sustain this. Oh, and suppose somebody turns on their TV and says, you know what? I don't want to be trapped in a Bank Vault for the next 45 minutes. You're dead. I mean, you know, the difference between them watching you and them watching the next show is that. You know, so, and they said, they looked at me, and of course, being executives, they got mad. <laughs> and they said, well, we're not going to unsell the show, so you have to come up with something that works. Oh, okay. So, I started trying to come up with some other ideas that kind of traded off, you know, Hourglass. He was the man of the, he was the court of last resort. I said, what does that mean? They said, you're the writer. And I said, oh, okay. So I started coming up with ideas. We went to the network. Network didn't like that idea. Came up with another idea, went into the network. Network said, nah, we don't like that idea. So I called my agent and said, wait a minute, I was just supposed to write this thing. Now, you know, now they have me kind of coming up with endless ideas. He said, well, you're the one who told them it wouldn't work. And I said, well, okay, but I thought that was my job. Well, okay, now it's your job to come up with something that will work. So, so in true MacGyver fashion, and maker fashion. I went to all my writer friends, and I got us all in the room, and I said, we're not leaving here until I got a show that's going to satisfy this deal. We're locked in a room, and we got to come up with a way to get out. And so we started kicking around ideas, and lo and behold, you know, my father, may he rest in peace, um, my father was one of those guys who could fix anything with anything. I mean, electrical, mechanical, carpentry, masonry, plumbing. He was just one of those guys who could do all that. And indeed, you'll know, this is about, I'm about to tell you where MacGyver got a Swiss Army knife. Um, when I was about, I would say 10 years old, my father gave me a Swiss Army knife. And he said, this is one of the most valuable tools you will ever have. Keep it with you at all times. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is where MacGyver got his Swiss Army knife. And so we started talking, and my friends said, well, you know, your dad was this great guy. And I went, okay. And they said, so suppose he doesn't have a gun. Suppose he just uses whatever's around, you know, to get out of jail. I said, oh, you know, I really like that. So we started to play with that. And then, 
And then we said, okay, we gotta come up with a we gotta come up with a name for this guy. Well at that time, for those of you who remember, there was a time once I'll, I'll guess you raise your hands again. Who remembers when McDonald's used to put on their signs how many hamburgers they had sold? Ow, look at that! Outstanding. So for those of you who don't remember, they used to put, you know, five million sold, ten million sold. Well, it started to get into the like tens of millions, the hundreds of millions. I guess they got embarrassed. People would start thinking, man, that's a lot of cows, isn't it? You know, so, so they just kind of dropped that. And um, so anything that was wildly popular at that point was given the, you know, the prefix Mac. Okay, so when USA Today came out and was a big hit as a newspaper, they called it McNewspaper. And when this thing came out, they called it, you know, McThis and McThat. I said, okay, I want the show to be about a guy. Let's call him McGuy. And my friend said, no, no, you need three syllables, lady. Two syllables is too stunted. So we kept playing and finally it came out, MacGyver. I went, great, I love it, good Scottish name, okay. We call him MacGyver. I went into the studio, went into the network, I said his name's MacGyver. He uses stuff that he finds, you know, what I call vernacular technology, okay, whatever happens to be around. So he uses that stuff, he doesn't carry a gun, he doesn't drive a fast car, and he's kind of not like James Bond, you know, he's not, he's not smug, you know, James Bond is, you know, shake it, not stir it, it's like, come on, you know, it's like, and Mission Impossible, you know, it's very slick, okay, so no, no, MacGyver is like the guy next door, okay, MacGyver's got to be really down home, so, so we went in and we pitched this, and, and the network said, yeah, you know, we kind of like this one. I said, great. I was out the room before they could say no. Okay, boom, I'm on my computer, I'm banging away. I wrote, I wrote the pilot for MacGyver, and, and, they, and they bought it. You know, they kept trying to say, well, why? how come he doesn't have a gun? I said, well, because if he has a gun, then he doesn't need to do all those cool things. So, no gun, no gun. And of course, that became like the real mainstay of the series which was this guy, you know, it's kind of like bright makes right instead of Mike makes right. He was like the guy who didn't, you know, you know how it is in movies, like some guy comes out, you know, the bad guys, five bad guys have like Uzi machine guns, and the good guy has like a pistol. They don't, he doesn't get a scratch, he kills every one of them with one shot, you know? It's like, I don't want that for this character. So, so P.S. we didn't use a gun. Needless to say, the rest sort of turned out to be history. Now, back to St. John's for a second. I won't pretend for a second that I believed, thought, knew, predicted that when I created MacGyver, it was going to turn into the cultural phenomenon that it has become. For those of you who don't know, it is now a word in the dictionary. Um, be, it, be it the American Abridge, or the Webster's Miriam, or the OED, it's there, as both a noun and a verb. <laughs> Which is like the Swiss Army knife of words, you know? It's just like, to MacGyver is to kind of do that thing that MacGyver does, and a MacGyver is the thing that he just did, you know? So he MacGyvers a MacGyver, all right? The language, so, okay. So there I was, in effect, unbeknownst to me, unforeseen by me, doing exactly what I had kind of hoped to do when I was at St. John's, which was to say, create something that's out in the world in a way that, that a book might, but perhaps even more powerfully and pervasively. MacGyver has been sold in something like, or seen in something like 170 countries over the last, I guess see, it started in 84, so we're talking 30, 84 to 15, 25 years? 26 years, okay, which means it has been seen literally by billions and billions of people because in many of these countries it has run non-stop since it started. It actually, the series of seven seasons that were originally on ABC started, I think in 84 and ran to, um, 84, 85 and ran to 91, 92, okay? And I know this because I have traveled the world on other projects and wherever I go, MacGyver is there. I made a picture, I made a, I, I made a movie in Tunisia, which is in, in North Africa, kind of, sort of in the Middle East, not quite entirely, but, okay? Muslim country. They found out I had created MacGyver, I was a national hero. <laughs> Men would come out of their shops to shake my hand. I kid you not, women would come up to me on the street with their children and say, kiss this man. <laughs> Apparently, 
MacGyver was so popular in Tunisia and Egypt and in other countries that, that when the show was on, the country would stop. You didn't shop, you didn't cook, MacGyver was on. And if you walked into a store and said, I need, they said, MacGyver's on. What is your problem? And it turns out this was true in South America, in Chile, and other places where I've traveled. So it has become, obviously, this sort of worldwide mem or meme to kind of use what is at your disposal. Now, I don't know if he's going to mention when he comes, but I have been approached by the military to, to participate and consult and do all sorts of things because of the military has slowly but surely begun to adopt even by their, own, by their own words, a MacGyver mentality, which is, we used to be, okay, one of the great things the American military, military can do is if, if you need a lot of men and material in place, man, we can get there. We got ships, we got planes, we got vehicles. I mean, we are better at moving stuff than any, probably any other military in the world. One of the things they're learning, though, is, first of all, you move all that stuff, you got to maintain all that stuff, and then when you're done doing what you're doing there, you got to move all that stuff back. Okay? So more and more, the military is learning. We have to figure out ways to use what's there as much as possible. So what we're not using enormous amounts of energy and manpower just transporting stuff. Okay? I promise I will leave you some time for questions. So here's what's going on in the world of MacGyver now. Um, what's going on in the world of the guy right now is we are working on a feature, New Line Cinema is working on a feature film, a big budget feature film in MacGyver. Keep your fingers crossed, where we have a script coming in from a talented writer. It's supposed to, of course, writers being writers, it was supposed to be in a couple weeks ago. We're still holding our breath, but, but we're very excited because I think, um, I think it, the timing is right for a MacGyver movie, and I think it's the sort of thing a lot of people would respond to. Um, we're also in the process now of just beginning to approach uh, some networks about the possibility of doing a MacGyver reality show called Are You a Real MacGyver? Okay, in which people like you, makers out there, can come in and basically say, I think I have what it takes to be a MacGyver. And we'll put them, you know, you've seen obviously competition reality shows before, we'll put them through a series of, you know, of challenges. So that's another thing that's happening in the world of MacGyver. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, so, so, I don't know how many of you know, and there are these wonderful things now developing, I suppose, I'm told now there's like 300 of around the country called hackerspaces. How many of you have heard that expression before, hackerspace? Okay, good, this is good. Well, those of you who haven't have just heard it, okay? And what a hackerspace is, uh, simply put, is a group of people who get together who like to make things. And usually, cooperatively, they find a space, a garage, a warehouse, a basement, whatever it is, okay? And they, they stuff it with tools uh, of various sorts, some sophisticated, some, you know, pretty basic hand tools. And they sit around and talk about things they'd like to make. And, and it's kind of that whole, we can do it ourselves. We don't need everything manufactured for us, our guys in China, okay? And not only that, but we can sort of take back this technology. How many of you heard about Make Magazine, for instance, before you heard about this fair? Wow, that's also pretty good. This is great. Okay. So, um, so the hackerspace is really, in some ways, kind of an extension of that whole MacGyver mentality, except taken into sort of a group mode, which is we're going to get together, and it's partly social, okay, and it's partly creative, and it's partly to make things that uh, they otherwise might not have. So now I guess we've just got a few minutes left, so if, does anybody have any questions for me? None? Nobody? Oh, I see a question there. Uh, what kind of consultants did you have on hand? Like telling you, no, you can't put ice in that thing that'll break that lock open, that's ridiculous. Oh, okay. You know, there were, there were... Like a reality check. And absolutely. No, when I, I don't pretend to be that, that technically sophisticated. I mean, I'm a... I'm, I'm more of a left brain guy, not a right brain guy. I think, did I get that brain right, Stu? Okay, okay. Um, showed you that, how left brain I am. Um, so when I started to do this series, I found a guy named John Koigla, who, who you know, had degrees in chemistry and physics and stuff like that. And the way we did it was, I would start to kind of 
say, well, here's a situation I'd love to see. What can we come up with that's cool that he can use to defeat the situation? We would kind of work it back and forth. And then he worked on the series for quite some time. And there was another guy named John Potter, who's also um, a kind of scientist type. I think he builds like clean rooms for the nuclear industry and, and uh, you know, the technology industries. And he also, and so it kind of worked in two ways. Sometimes the writers of the show would say, okay, we want to do something like this, can you come up with something cool for us? And conversely, we would, I didn't run the series, I, I wrote the pilot and created it, and then I kind of turned it over to other people to run it. But, um, so what they would do is they would say uh, to, the, to those technical guys, you come up with some cool stuff, and if, if we like it, then we'll write a script to kind of make it fit that. So it kind of worked it from both sides, but the answer was yes. And, and I think kind of the rule of thumb was, it doesn't have to work exactly. It just had to be kind of credible, you know, and, and plausible, I think was the word we used. So, so that, that was how that worked. So yeah, they were technical consultants. Please. Were you annoyed or flattered by the Uber sketches? Um, the question is, was I annoyed or fl uh, flattered by the MacGruber sketches? And the answer is, I, I thought the MacGruber sketches were quite funny when they were first on Saturday Night Live. I mean, they were obviously a silly, you know, parody of MacGyver. Uh, and so I thought it was great. I mean, look, you know, popular culture has sort of kept this character, MacGyver character, alive like the Simpsons. You know, Lisa Simpson loved MacGyver, her aunts were like, Rabbit MacGyver fanatics, you know. I think they kidnapped him in one episode, didn't they? And, and, and so I thought it was funny. When they suddenly decided well, we're going to go make a MacGruber movie, then I kind of got annoyed. Because then I thought they were really taking it sort of one step too far. And, and because we were in the process of doing the MacGyver movie, I was really thought that they were kind of competing in the same space as we were. So there were lawyers and stuff involved, but they went ahead and made the movie anyway. P.S. I didn't see the movie, but but it did not do well, and that's putting it politely. Okay? It it I think the word is bomb. So um, another question, yes. Um, why do you think there's been a resurgence recently? Like usually, ten years after a show goes off the air, there's not a parody sketch on Saturday Night Live. Why do you think there's this recent resurgence? Uh, the question is, why do I think there's a recent resurgence? Well. I, I, I'm not sure it ever quite fully went away, but, but I think it, the resurgence is partly because of the times, you know. We're kind of having to sort of go back to our, our, our centers and our sources because the way, you know, in our country, God bless us, it was more, better, faster, bigger. And that kind of went on for a long time, and now we're, ooh, slower, more efficient, smarter, smaller. And, and it's kind of like, now you have to sort of be a little more clever with how you're going to manage your life because that kind of endless cornucopia that was America is starting to contract and probably will for a long time. I mean, let's face it, we have less than 5% of the world's population. We use 25% of the world's energy resources. How long do you think we can go on doing that? You know, at some point, like China and India are going to take, uh, you know, we don't really, we're not cool with this anymore. So, and by the way, we're not going to be able to afford it anymore. So, problem, it's a problem. Are you, oh, you're waving to your mother, oh, I'm sorry. Another question, somebody had another question? I'll ask a question. Sure. So, Detroit's investing a lot in the film industry and film production. What's the Hollywood view of what Detroit's doing? Well, I think, um, this is crass and crude, but it's true. Hollywood will probably try and go wherever they can make the best deal. So if Detroit, if they look at a project and say, it'll work in Detroit and it's going to save us a chunk of dough, we'll go to Detroit. If tomorrow Illinois has a better deal than Chicago, then you know, I mean, than, than Michigan, they'll look to go to Illinois. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. It's, you know, production is an expensive business and studios, independent films, networks are going to try and do it for as little money as they possibly can because that's the nature of the beast. So, I think it has clearly helped Detroit that, uh, and, and you know, Illinois that, they're, that they've made this deal. It has historically worked in many other places. One I know of in particular is New Mexico, for instance. Um, how long it will work? 
is partly dependent upon what, what the other states in the country are willing to do to lower production. So, yes, please. Where, the question is, where did MacGyver learn all the things that he knows? Um, and the answer is, it'll be revealed in the movie. <laughs> Oh man, what we, the question is, what was my favorite MacGyver Tricker episode? Man, you know, that's really hard to say because there were so many. Um, but but the, the one that, one of my favorite ones was in the pilot, okay? You know, he, he's going in, I don't know who, how many of you remember the pilot, but in the pilot it was kind of like the Andromeda strain. He's trapped in this, you know, big government high-tech facility and he's got to get his, himself all the way down to the bottom of this thing to rescue somebody. And along the way, he finds a broken candy machine. And he collects up a bunch of bars of chocolate. And the woman he's with, because it's always a woman, come on. Um, the woman he's with says, well, what are you doing? He goes, well, you never know. And I like chocolate. And, and when he gets down to the bottom, there's a big tank leaking sulfuric acid. And he uses the chocolate bars to seal the, uh, to seal the crack in the, in the tank because the sugars will, the sh I'm told this, okay, the sugars in the chocolate bar will react with the, um, with the sulfuric acid and, and the cocoa paste to create this sort of gummy, gluey-like substance, and it seals the crack. And, and the network just loved that. And so I turned the show over, you know, and there are a bunch of writers, and they start calling me going, okay, they want stuff like the chocolate bar. How did you do that, man? That stuff's killing us. That's hard to do. We can't come up with that stuff. I mean, we come up with stories, but that stuff is hard. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the consultants. And that's how I turned them on to the consultant I had used and said, here, he'll help you figure it out. Yes, please. Really, that's really for sure we were taking Anderson and uh, I would say, more likely than not, it would definitely be sure not be Richard. Because I think what we're trying to do, and again, things change in Hollywood, so I can't make any promises. Um, but we're really going to try what we call a creation story. That is, we're going to try and tell the story of a young MacGyver and how he became the character that we know, rather than starting with a guy and saying, you're MacGyver, watch him do what he does. So, any other questions? Last question. Last question. No? Everybody's good? Well, then enjoy Maker Fair. Thank you very much. <laughs>